I'm very grateful to be able to present my work to you today. Um, I'm going to be reading um, a version of the chapter. I've edited it down so it should be it should run um, efficiently and and hopefully will be uh, enjoyable. But it's not a completely finished piece of work, so I am interested in any feedback that you have, um, in particular on recent logo designs, which might be an interesting um, topic to discuss in the Q&A session. Because um, one, one of the things I'm going to talk about in the talk is the co-creation of uh, brand identities, where consumers will provide feedback to companies, um, whether, showing whether they hate a brand or, or love a brand, and then those will be fed back into the design process. So the name of the chapter is The Responsive Brand, Uniformity and Flexibility in Logo Design. From the uniformity of modernism to the embrace of difference, this chapter explores the historical shift from static to dynamic logos, from universal international brand identities to more flexible and responsive corporate personalities. This transformation occurred in a process extending from the 19th century to the present, charted in this chapter, which investigates the roots of branding, the ideas of modernism, the emergence of the critical consumer, the development of the responsive corporation, and the co-creation of brands in online landscapes. Just wanted to show you the, um, Grace discussed the book that we're working on, and we had a few mock-ups made by our publisher, Bloomsbury, so I just wanted to present those here. Uh, the book is called Reading Graphic Design in Cultural Context. From Peter Behrens' designs for the AEG, the German Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft, in 1907, considered the first corporate identity, to Paul Rand's flexible and humanizing identity for IBM, International Business, Mach Business Machines, after World War II, this chapter charts the rise of the unchanging logo, in turn, the multivalent brand mark, here Nike and Gap. Nike is examined through local interpretations of the global brand. Gap's failed logo of 2010 shows the power of the online consumer and the need for companies to listen and respond. Finally, brand reactions to the responsive consumer, characterized by chameleon-like logo transformation and an emphasis on user interaction and co-production of meeting, meaning is investigated through the designs for telecommunications company Olo, this is Olo for iPad, by Bibliotech, a London design company, and the responsive W created by Experimental Jet Set for the Whitney Museum in 2011. So the heading of the next section is From Modernist Universality to Corporate Personality, What AEG Taught IBM. The German architect and designer Peter Behrens is regarded as the grandfather of corporate identity for his rigorous application of a consistent house style at AEG and for his influence on successive designers, including Paul Rand at IBM. At the turn of the century in Europe and America, a rapidly expanding consumer economy and resultant glut of cheap and varied goods were seen by some cultural commentators as symptoms of a moral crisis, in which capitalist values appeared to trump all others. One way to address this concern, many modernists felt, was to pursue universal and timeless <coughs> design. This included the rejection of historical styles and a search for an enduring aesthetic based on pure geometric forms. Barron's corporate identity for AEG was seen by his contemporaries as an antidote to the detrimental effects of capitalism, especially the selling of goods based on historical styles and the use of novelty 
and excessive marketing to increase sales. The modernist appreciation of AEG's logo as a moral corrective to the dynamic reality of consumer culture, which prized fashion and constant transformation, can be contrasted with examples of visual identity from the early 21st century, which have sought visual elasticity in order to relate to engaged consumers. Both approaches show a moral concern with the needs of people, while addressing them in seemingly opposite ways. <clears throat> Elliot F. Noyes, IBM's first consultant director of design at IBM, was largely responsible for its World War II corporate identity. Hired in 1956, Noyes was charged with coordinating the design of everything at IBM from its logos and interiors to its computers and buildings. Noyes, an architect and product designer, handed graphic design responsibilities to Paul Rand. IBM's makeover was not merely aesthetic, it had significant public relations advantages. According to Noyes' mentor at Harvard University and a former employee of Barron's, Walter Gropius, good design benefited business, workers, and society. This view was shared by Thomas J. Watson, Jr., chairman and CEO at IBM. In 1955, Rand was commissioned by Watson to produce an in-depth study of IBM's printed materials, which were considered by Noyes to be confused and outdated. Rand was highly critical of IBM's graphic identity, noting an inconsistent typographic style and a logo lacking in distinction. Rand concluded that the absence of family resemblance across the company graphics makes it difficult satisfactorily to establish a company personality. Rand argued that what was required was a centralized and coordinated integration of design standards across the organization. The first step in achieving this goal was the redesign of the company trademark, which Rand considered commonplace and lacking in precision and definition. It needed to, quote, express dignity, authority, efficiency, and modernity. But in order to maintain familiarity and family resemblance, it should not diverge greatly from the existing logo. Because IBM's technologically sophisticated goods were beyond most consumers' comprehension, Rand felt the logo was essential as a symbol of technological dependability and innovation. Rand understood that the logo achieved its power not through fixing its meaning, but through being flexible and open to a range of meanings. As early as 1955, he indicated that the IBM logo would benefit from visual variation. Not satisfied with a singular approach to the design of the logo type, he wrote, some graphic feature, when possible, might be added to give the mark even more distinction and to increase its flexibility. Rand would later create many variations of the IBM logo, ranging from the addition of horizontal stripes to its reinterpretation as a rebus. Although not used until 1970, in 1962, Rand added eight horizontal stripes to his logo design, re resulting in the familiar brand mark that is now widely recognized as the company signature. Rand did not consider the lines to have any representational value, but believed that their rhythm resolved an inherent visual awkwardness in the design without lines. Nevertheless, the logo carries a range of meanings. In fact, IBM executives interpreted the horizontal bands as prison stripes, a prejudice that delayed the logo's introduction and acceptance. The horizontal strokes and gaps can be associated with communication and technology and can be read as the dashes and spaces of telegraphy, as well as the on-off logic of computer language. In 1972, Rand designed a 13-striped version that perhaps more explicitly suggested speed, repetition, and movement. Rand later created a witty interpretation of the letters IBM as a rebus of an I, a B, and the striped letter M. In a 1981 poster for, for an in-house event, the striped M 
from the city medium typeface was easily recognizable as that of IBM. However, IBM's management disliked the playful engagement with the firm's logo, failing to appreciate that this single act helped to humanize what some people saw as a faceless corporation. So the next section of the chapter is called Challenging the Logo, the Postmodern Consumer and Nike Reinterpreted. Seeing a corporation as faceless and inhuman can make it easier to rebel against. While IBM was not a target of the anti-branding movement of the late 90s, other global firms such as McDonald's, Nike, and Starbucks were. This brand rebellion was a response to issues ranging from the corporate degradation of the environment to the exploitation of labor in developing countries. It was characterized by consumer empowerment, culture hijacking, and consumer resistance to brands, and stimulated by the muckraking rhetoric and brand spoofs, or subvertisements, of Callie Lawson's Canadian-based Adbusters magazine. It was documented in No Logo, Taking Aim at the Brand Bullies by <coughs> Naomi Klein in 1999. As the anti-logo movement developed, marketers could not explain this brand rebellion. The most successful companies and the ones which most closely adhered to the advice of marketing theorists, such as Nike, Coke, McDonald's, Microsoft, and Starbucks, were vilified by anti-branders. How could this be explained? To understand the origins of this brand rebellion, we need to reflect on the history of mass culture criticism. After World War II, an influential group of mass culture critics developed the cultural authority model, in which the producers of brands were understood as cultural engineers who controlled society. Consumer society, they claimed, was organized around the cultural authority of marketers who were part of a wider culture industry. Those consumers who accepted this state of affairs allowed firms to organize their tastes. The culture industry, typified by post-World War II mass media, television, music, film, advertising, and branding, and consumer goods, had, quote, defanged political opposition by restructuring it as taste. In this new system, former acts of resistance, such as the labor conflicts, which accompanied early industrial capitalism, were quelled by mass culture industries, including the consumption of branded goods. However, a more positive take on the cultural authority model can be associated with the postmodern consumer who resisted and reworked the meanings offered by marketers and brands. These acts of resistance are at the heart of the anti-branding movement, enacted through public protests against global brands and the cultural jamming of adbusters and others. The brand parodies of adbusters can be seen as a form of psychological resistance to the postmodern experience where pervasive advertising clutter contributes to a feeling of an increased speed of life, fragmentation of the self, and the decentering of individual identity. However, the postmodern condition has also produced the active postmodern consumer who redefined the roles of producers and consumers by constructing his or her own symbols and recombining existing ones. Jeff Murray and Julie Ozan have outlined ways that consumers can break free of the chains of brand-imposed social values. They follow Jean Baudrillard, who considered consumer culture to be made up of consumption code, a system of meanings the market embeds in goods, and Jürgen Habermas, who recognized an imbalance in the control of this code favoring the marketers, for example, in the form of brand consultants, advertisers, etc who produce and disseminate it, and consumers who have no option but to engage in it. Ozan and Murray believe that freedom within such a system is only possible if consumers become aware of the code and separate out the manipulative marketer's messages from the actual use value of the product. Fuat Firat and Aladi Venkatesh have extended this analysis and placed it within the context of postmodernity. They argue that we are in a phase where diverging and multiple consumption styles are increasing, and these will emancipate society from the control of marketers. 
They recognize that consumers, rather than depending on brands to produce their cultural worlds, are now beginning to produce their own values, identities, and culture outside of those provided by the often domineering and restrictive brands. The Nike swoosh became one such symbol that was vulnerable to such acts of postmodern manipulation. The Nike tick, as it is also known, has become a potent and ubiquitous global symbol. This is perhaps in part due to its consistent <coughs> and enduring use as an unchanging standalone symbol. Nike's marketing strategy has been based on a contract with the consumer. Purchase this authentic symbol via the goods we manufacture and you will be associated with greatness and achievement. Nike's brand values, sorry, those are Nike's brand's values. However, purchases of genuine Nike goods are not necessary to build a Nike identity. As Paul Bick and Serena Chiper have observed in their study of counterfeit Nike goods and refashioned Nike logos in Haiti and Romania. In fact, As the Nike swoosh is transformed, rescaled, stretched, etc., through its application on unofficial handbags and hoodies, new meanings coalesce. In Romania, the Nike tick has become a V for victory, or is seen as a horizontal J for the basketball player and Nike sponsor Michael Jordan. Used on a gravestone in Haiti, the swoosh takes on local connotations in a religious context appearing as, quote, a warm and comforting version of the icon, thick-bodied, gracefully curved, pale, blue, and lying at rest on its side, like a Caribbean wave. The design of the swoosh, its simplicity, its independence from text, its ambiguous shape, facilitate a range of meanings, even in illiterate or non-English speaking communities. This semantic openness and conceptual flexibility allows local meanings to be inscribed on this international symbol. In Nike culture, the sign of the swoosh, Goldman and Papson discuss the visual omnipresence of the Nike swoosh, its global recognition, and its affordance of signifying excellence in sports, self-determination, and hip authenticity, even without the word Nike. However, the authors also discuss the problem of what they call over swooshification, where the more ubiquitous the logo becomes, the less value it had. Over swooshification, the overexposure of a mass distributed commodified symbol, can result in a free floating logo untethered from its original commercial meanings. The ease with which the Nike logo has been reinterpreted and recontextualized in developing countries is perhaps a direct result of its symbolic overextension, resulting in its accommodation to and adoption of local meanings. The next section is entitled Gaps, Gaff, and the Birth of the Responsive Logo. While the Nike logo led to local and global variations, a recent Gap brand mark resulted in an online outcry. The failed launch of Gap's new logo in 2010 exemplified the influence of online feedback on brand design. The closed retailer's unveiling of a new corporate symbol resulted in a storm of negative online feedback, culminating in the reinstatement of its previous logo. The about face not only illustrated the power of consumers to influence the visual identity of brands, but also demonstrated the remarkable speed at which this can occur. Before the internet became a feature of daily life, a corporate response of this kind would have taken months. Now brands must react almost in real time. In 2010, Gap Inc. junked its logo of nearly 20 years. Misreading consumer attachment to its old corporate symbol, the new one, designed by Gap with Laird and Partners New York, appeared on Gap.com on October 6 in 2010 and was quickly derided across the internet. 
The new Gap logo looked very different from the old one. It stood outside of the iconic blue box, which was diminished in size, set in the background, and moved to the upper right behind the lowercase p. Initially, Gap put on a brave face and sought a positive spin in its corporate response, enthusing. We know this logo created a lot of buzz and we're thrilled to see passionate debate unfolding. But as the volume of criticism grew, Gap quickly expressed defeat on its Facebook page. We've heard loud and clear that you don't like the new logo, the retailer concluded. We're bringing back the blue box tonight. Shortly afterwards, the president of Gap North America, Mark Hansen, added, we are clear that we did not go about this in the right way. We recognize that we missed the opportunity to engage with the online community. The Gap gaffe has become part of branding lore, a stark warning symbolizing the dangers of online branding and the need to respond to consumers in real time. Developments in communications technology, most notably the internet and social media networks such as Facebook and Twitter, have challenged the erstwhile one-way communication of traditional branding, toppling the cultural authority model typified by top-down corporate control. As a result, the form and concept of the static logo has been rethought by branding professionals and graphic designers. Describing the impact on branding, global CEO at Interbrand London, Jez Frampton, noted in 2012, today's consumers can connect with many brands through multiple channels, and many of these channels fall outside marketers' control. No longer are consumers simply influenced by brands, now brands themselves are being reviewed, shaped, and even co-created by consumers. In the pre-internet age, organizations were thought to hold the balance of power in the production of brand meaning. They produced and promoted the product while the customer's role was limited to using it. With the advent of online communities, consumers had become powerful brand influencers co-creating brand meaning. Social commerce, the combination of customer-focused computer technology and the rise of social networks, results in an environment where consumers have become brand ambassadors, thus aiding or damaging a company's image. Social media and mass access to the internet and brand democratization put consumers in command as online reviewers and critics. They, or we, now have the tools to control and change their relationships with brands from purchaser to designer, ad creator, critic, or promoter with access to blogs, social networking sites, wikis, video sharing, and product review sites. The concept of co-creation has taken on central importance in branding theory and branding practice. In co-creation, consumers and companies collaboratively create brand meanings. Co-creation is seen as a paradigm shift and includes the concepts of co-production and consumer involvement, where consumers and companies interact to create value. Prosumption, where consumers create their own products. Consumer empowerment, through education. Culture hijacking, such as the Adbusters parodies, and consumer resistance, where consumers outflank marketers through defiant or oppositional consumption. In response to such developments, brand strategists have suggested a user-generated branding approach where firm-sponsored, brand-related, user-produced content is carefully edited and integrated into brand communications. This company-centric approach to generating content, however, does not ring true to users as genuine, as genuine, non-sponsored, user-produced content. It is instead seen as carefully orchestrated, albeit user-derived content, and is thus consistent with the, quote, industrial age, company control-centric paradigm. Responsive visual identities, however, offer a way to visually communicate that a company is flexible, nimble, and aware. Responsive design has multiple meanings. It can refer to the way in which graphic elements can change in ratio to different mobile devices, from iPhones to iPads.
However, it can also refer to how the brand identities can respond to user interaction, a click, a swipe, a tap, or an IP address. In recent years, there has been a proliferation of logos which move and change shape, represented by the various building shapes of Casa da Musica by Sagmeister and Walsh, shown here, the rotating box kite of Doyle and Partners from their Cooper Union logo of 2009, MIT, Media Labs, and their ever-changing searchlights by E. Rune Kang and the Green Isle of 2011. On the one hand, the recent trend in flexible visual identities is the result of the need to respond to different digital media environments. However, a dynamic logo also suggests that the brand is responsive, not only to different media, but also to its consumer. Can these shape-shifting logos be understood as a visual symbol of a company that listens? A new attitude towards the postmodern consumer, especially in the internet age. Illustrating the continuation of this trend in technology-driven responsive design is the 2012 brand identity for the telecommunications company Olo by Bibliotech London. The Olo logo was promoted as the first to exploit the new multi-touch hardware of smartphones and tablets. An iPad app was released that allowed users to pull and stretch the logo, but when let go, it returned to the original Olo wordmark. Yet, even when stretched to an unrecognizable line, Olo's distinctive rainbow color palette retained the visual DNA of the brand. The brand guidelines called the logo, quote, soft, responsive, and alive, and suggested that it mirrored the brand strategy of, quote, infinite possibilities. When interviewed in 2014 about the benefits of brand co-creation, Timothy Beard, founder of Bibliotech, replied that because brand execution was presently in a state of flux and consumers could more easily compare products, brand allegiance had become short term. He said, so encouraging consumers to have a direct influence over a brand or the products a brand produces enables another level of direct interaction where the consumer feels like they are in control thus creating engagement and emotion, which any strong brand is looking for. Reflecting on the impact of the anti-branding movement and the recent gap U-turn, the emphasis on making consumers feel in control while seeking an emotional bond makes strategic sense. The Olo app lets users play with the logo, literally transforming the brand identity and symbolically reshaping the actual brand at least within the context of the iPad app. This kind of imaginative engagement in the form and meaning of a brand is one type of aesthetic co-creation. This is a long way from the brand rebellion of the anti-brand activists. However, it diverges from the top-down one-way communication mindset of 20th century big brands. Just how much this appearance of control might satisfy a real user desire for corporate flexibility and audience interaction remains to be seen. In 2013, the Whitney Museum, New York, revealed its new visual identity designed by Experimental Jet Set. Diverging from the tradition of the static logo, the new design makes central use of a shape-changing black Neue Haas grotesque W that stretches and extends to fit around visual and textual content. Recently, museums have embraced digital capabilities to engage remote and local publics, ranging from accessible online collections to interactive technology in the museum setting. 
A responsive and up-to-date visual identity is consistent with the active audience that 21st century museums seek. Conclusion. Flexible uniformity, co-created balance. Branding balances the needs of commerce with those of consumers. Increasingly, this is achieved through a feedback loop between firms and their markets. During the 20th century, companies sought varying methods to maintain this balance. In the case of AEG and IBM, pleasing aesthetics communicated an ethical concern for the betterment of society. According to his contemporaries, Behrens used his AEG design to counter the visual degradation wrought by uncontrolled capitalism. With humor and wit, Paul Rand humanized IBM, a faceless technological giant. Gap's 2010 failed logo was a stark warning to listen to consumers, proving that a blue box and three letters held powerful personal meanings for many. Nike's text-free swoosh aided its accrual of new meanings in global contexts. While, more recently, flexible digital logos, including those for Olo and the Whitney Museum, suggest real-time responsiveness to consumers' audiences. Balancing the relationship between user engagement and company goals is a requirement in developing and maintaining brands. However, brands should be considered not only company-controlled, but also socially constructed entities. Complex socio-cultural socio phenomena made up of interrelated brand meanings. These brand meanings might indicate social betterment, as in the case of AEG and IBM, as well as personal achievement, a brand value associated with Nike. However, unpredictable user actions, e.g. online critiques, anti-globalization protests, etc., may derail a firm's attempt to control its brand messages. Companies may control the manifestations of their brand to a certain extent in the form of products, visual identity, etc. However, each person ultimately develops his or her own personal brand understanding based on various individual as well as socio-cultural factors. Brand meaning is not only dependent on a complex web of contextual factors, but at its most fundamental, it is co-created by firms and their audiences. If the balance becomes unequal, it can also be co-destructive. Brand managers and graphic designers have shown an increasing awareness of this fact, making use of digital technology and dynamic identities, whether generative or responsive, to visually represent engagement with consumers. Thank you very much.